Dave, you're talking about you adopted a ketogenic diet, which is it's high fat, it's low in carbohydrates. You got your blood work done. You saw extremely elevated LDL cholesterol. What level was that at? Uh, historically, my total cholesterol was around 180. My LDL historically was around 120 to 130, which is right about the midpoint for a male my age. When I adopted the ketogenic diet, I believe my total had gone up to something like 340 or 350, my LDL to something like 240, 250, something. Right. And at, at the same time, your HDL was relatively high and triglycerides relatively low, I'm presuming. Correct. Both of those moved in that direction. Right. Okay. And was that like a, a new sort of cluster of lipids that you hadn't seen before? I, I guess where I'm getting at is why look at that and, and think, wow, that's that's interesting when you know I know that there's other lipidologists who I guess just look at that and say, well, his LDL is elevated. That's, that's not optimal. It can't be optimal. <laughs> So a couple of thoughts. Um, I, I don't believe that people have high LDL for a long time with impunity. Um, so I think you, you will eventually have a consequential bridge to cross in most cases. The higher, the longer, the worse. Now, for the reasons that things are going up in lipidology, we think of production and clearance. Whatever I have a lot of, I made a lot, I didn't get rid of it, or both. So if Dave is making a diet modification, as LDL almost doubles, is that a production problem? Is that a clearance problem? Is that a combination of the two? And when you think through those pathways and it's happening in a matter of days, that challenges some of our thinking as to why LDL is historically high in people, for example, with a genetic problem where they can't clear their LDL. Now, clearance uh, doesn't change that quickly in that short a period of time necessarily. So just the time frame of these fairly significant changes in a short period of time. And then me as a lipidologist thinking production, clearance, both, what's going on here? Right. So so your question is, are those APOB containing lipoproteins behaving similarly in, within that context to other contexts? Well, two questions. Why they're high? What mechanism is driving them? And then um, we really go back to the model that we most commonly see people in a, an unfavorable lipoprotein state chronically. And their chronically abnormal lipoproteins are contributory to their vascular risk. Um, have we seen series where people were otherwise fine for the majority of their life? And then a switch was thrown. And now we have LDLs in a level that would historically be very worrisome. Um, does it stay there? Is that their new normal? If it's that new normal, then we have a different conversation. Well, what happens after three, four, five, ten years of this, right? Uh, maybe this is transient. Maybe what we're catching is the body adapting to uh, some sort of major uh, macromolecule uh, change, and it's going to peak and it's going to come down. And to some people, it does. Are you saying, like, so it's, it peaks and then it comes down back to a, a new kind of baseline over weeks or months, or are you talking about throughout the day it's going up and coming back down? So this was the, the, the interest, right? So Dave was the first person that could show me data where we could begin to ask those types of questions. And so early on, why would I take an interest? Because this type of time frame of change I hadn't seen before. And there are a lot of questions of, well, how long does it take? And how uh, steady state is it once it gets there? Uh, are there people, for example, who are reasonably compliant with the same diet over time? And the numbers go up to a new level and stay there. In some cases, for various reasons, do they attenuate and begin to come back down? They, these were all things I was interested in trying to understand. Has your LDL cholesterol remained at that level? I'm assuming that you've continued to yes. sort of adopt this ketogenic diet. Yeah, it has, which also conforms to the model, to the lipid energy model, per my expectation. When I was coming into this space, people did speculate that if you saw your LDL increase, it was probably going to come back down again. And to be fair, there is some context around that that's worth appreciating, which is that indeed, if you're actively losing fat mass, you are liberating more of the lipids that are inside your adipose tissue. And if that's happening, then sure, there actually is a clear physiological reason for which you might have higher uh, VLDL being produced by the liver and thus higher LDL. 
but once weight's stable, would you still see your LDL being higher? And I would contend that generally speaking, if you're metabolically healthy and generally leaner, it's more likely than not that not only will your LDL be higher, but even at weight stability, it's probably going to remain persistently higher, especially the leaner you are. This is more of a personal question. Um, and I'm kind of asking you to speculate a little bit, but why is it that you think some other lipidologists are not open to having these conversations with you? You know, I've actually, I've had this conversation with, uh, Bill literally just in the last hour, we, we were chatting on our way here. I really mean this when I say it, I genuinely think that a lot of, um, the lipid hypothesis not only is heavily entrenched, but there is a sense that obstruction of that, even as well-intentioned as you may want to cast it, can still be seen as harmful for their patient care. So I think a lot of people who are detractors to my research are actually genuinely well-intentioned. But to an extent, um, it's true. A number of them have difficulty having this conversation because they're concerned it's platforming a kind of, as is often you know referred to, a kind of denialist position or something along those lines. All I can do is the best that I can to continue to try to engage as reasonably and as cordially as I can. Mm -hmm.